Glory Hill Church. Can I hear you with the sound of your hands? Are you there? It's so good to see you. Would you all rise? It is so good to see your faces. I was just walking around talking to many of you. Hey, good to see you guys again. Uh, I just encourage to see other believers in Christ. God bless you. And to our friends listening in the parking lot to Foothill Live 90.9. We're so glad you're here, just here in spirit. And our friends at home, we long to see you here with us. We want to worship with you. God's been moving in these services. And, uh, but we're glad we're here, um, bonded through the Holy Spirit. So let's, we're going to start off the service uh, just singing a hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. I think it's important that we remind ourselves that worship, when we start at a service, it's not a warm-up song. This isn't a time just to express ourselves. This is our time where we remind ourselves of who God is and who we are to Him. So let's sing this all together, just all four verses, and, uh, and do that together now. Holy, holy, holy. holy and perfect God. Yeah? Let's sing this song to him. Listening to the lyrics, thinking about how these practically apply to us. 
don't just let it be another song you sing out. Let's remember that he is our hope, and he is a true hope and a faithful hope. And this is my prayer. This is my prayer in the desert, when all that's within me feels dry. This is my prayer in my hunger and need. My God is the God who provides. This is my prayer in the fire, in weakness or trial or pain. There is a faith proved of more worth than gold. So refine me, Lord, through the flames. And I will bring praise. I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice. I will declare God is my victory. Church, whether we feel this or not, let's sing it out. Teach our hearts who God is. Oh, all of my life, in every season, yes, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I do. I have a reason to worship you, my Lord, my King. All of my life, in every season, oh, you are still God.
church, this next song we're going to sing, uh, we're going to do in English and Spanish. And let this serve as a reminder that what unifies us is not the language we praise in. What unifies us is that we are all in Christ. So feel free to worship in whatever language you feel led to and know that we are all united in Christ. Fuiste el verbo en el principio, unigénito de Dios. En el misterio de tu gloria, revelado en tu amor, cuán hermoso su nombre es. Cuán hermoso su nombre es, el nombre de Jesús, mi rey. Cuán hermoso su nombre es, nadie se iguala a él. Cuán hermoso su nombre es, no hay otro nombre. your plan to reconcile us so Jesus you brought heaven down our sin was great but your love was greater and what could separate us now what a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name
It's true. Your name is powerful. When I say Jesus, something happens inside because that name means more than any other name. That name holds truth with it. That name holds salvation. That name holds our future and our true hope. And God, we are so grateful. So Lord, inspire us more to worship. We know you deserve it. We know it does our hearts good to bring it. So, God, we worship you this morning together as a church, as your church, for your purpose and your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, uh, good morning. You can go ahead and have a seat. If you're at home, you can have a seat as well. Uh, Kids, parents, if you guys are joining us for uh, the Foothill Kids service, we have some awesome volunteers in the back. You can see them waving those woodland creatures. Follow them to the services this morning uh, for the kids. And just as a reminder, parents, um, we're, we're asking that an adult would be with them. Someone from the household would be with them. And uh, moms and dads, this is just a great opportunity for you guys to model what family discipleship looks like to the kids. And so, um, yeah, take, opportunity, take that opportunity and, and do that. Um, well, good morning. Welcome to Foothill Church Outdoors. How you guys doing? Good? Yeah, you guys excited to be here? It's good to see you guys. It's good to see so many people here. It's a nice, beautiful day. Um, and uh, my name's Chris. I'm one of the ministers here at, on staff at Foothill. And um, I just, it's just so good, actually, to see your faces. And so um, I just wanted to uh, just let you guys know that uh, we, you know, we have online services. We're in, here in person. And if you're checking out with us online, good morning. Uh, it's good to see you guys, too, and, uh, you know, virtually, and uh, I just want to let you know, we, we miss you guys. We love you guys. We're praying for you, and, and when you guys are ready and, 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 and you feel it's safe to come back, we'd love to, we have a space for you as well. So, uh, well, good morning. Uh, here at Foothill Church, we exist to glorify God by leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ rooted in the gospel. This is our mission statement. We say this every Sunday, and um, one of the ways I actually want to challenge all of us here this morning and online uh, in that mission statement is to think about the people in your lives who maybe don't have this community. I mean, it's so awesome to see your faces. It's so awesome to be able to gather like this. But there's so many people that don't have that opportunity. A lot of people, you know, during this time, their, their communities have been kind of ripped from them, right? And so maybe they're more open than ever to to receive an invitation from a neighbor, from a friend, to, to come uh, join them in church. So it's just a great way to be able to live out that mission statement, to lead others uh, into a growing relationship with Jesus. So I want to welcome you to do that. And perhaps you are new this morning. Perhaps you're on the arm of a friend, or perhaps you're joining us online for the, for the very first time. I want to say a special welcome to you guys, too. Um, I'm just so glad that you're here, and um, if you're here in person, um, I'd love to meet you. I'll be standing out at the info tent at the end of service. And I'd love to shake your or give you a fist bump or a, a, a foot high five, whatever, whatever socially appropriate. But um, I'd love to meet you. And um, if you're joining us online or you're here in person, um, if you would just do us the favor of texting this number, 626-469-7070, just letting us know that you're here. You could text I'm new to that number. And really, that just lets us know that you're here to be able to partner with you in prayer, be able to see how, um, you know, how, how we can be, uh, you know, with you along the way in these next steps um, of your walk. So um, another thing too is maybe you have been joining us online for months um, and the last three weeks, four weeks, I guess this is our fourth week doing this, maybe you just started coming in person and you hadn't done that before. I would love to meet you. We would love to know that you're here too. If you haven't received a gift from us, you can stop by that info tent area as well and pick up a gift. Um, Well, if you've never taken our Foothill 101 class um, or have gone through our growth track process, I want to invite you guys to do that as well. So um, our Foothill uh, uh, growth track classes are, it's just a way for you to kind of know what we're about. Who's on staff? 
uh, what we believe as a church, why we believe it. Um, if you've ever kind of asked these questions, if you want to get to know more about Foothill, um, you can text 101 to that same number, 626 626- Four six nine seventy seventy, and uh, you know we'll get we'll get in contact with you with more information on how you can um, take the next class. Um, well, we are currently in the middle of our season our, of our current giving campaign for the last three, I think, four years. We've been able to do this to the end of the earth giving campaign. And basically what this is, is and, and you guys, it, it's just been such a blessing to see how God has worked through you guys, Foothill, um, to be able to provide and send money out for church planting. And that th- this is what this is. We partner with church planting churches that that are, are, are you know, uh, multiplying themselves. They're, they're sharing the gospel in the communities around them here locally, you know, all, you know, in Chino and Ranch Cucamonga, but then also to the ends of the earth in Ireland and, and, and around the world. And so um, currently, I just want to share an update with you guys. Currently, we have close to $113,000 pledged to the end of the earth campaign. Can we get a hand for that? That's awesome, right? Yeah, we're about 50% there. And, and, and again, you can go, you can go online to foothill.church slash send and you can grab one of those virtual numbers and if we if everyone grabbed one of those numbers we would meet our goal by the end of the year and and it's crazy to think that just a few years ago hundred and you know hundred twelve hundred thirteen thousand that was our goal but now like we're already there and we're, we're at 50 percent so uh, I just want to encourage you guys to do that you can grab an envelope as a family my wife and I have grabbed an envelope you can encourage your kids to do that as well and participate as a family so uh, as we prepare for our time of giving this morning, I just want to tell you two ways that you can give here at Foothill. The first way you can give is uh, through our Foothill Church app. And if you didn't know that, we, yeah, we have an app. You can download that from the app store. Um, the second way that you can give is online at foothill.church slash give. Um, so as I was kind of preparing this week to, to talk about giving, um, I was curious as to maybe some of the psychological reasons why people give. Um, and so I kind of was looking into this, and I found that, that humans really have many reasons why they give to a cause or they give of their money, but these three kind of stood out, and I want to share them with you. Uh, number one, people give because they believe in the mission of the organization. Okay. Uh, number two, people give because they believe that their gift makes a difference. And number three, people may even give because they believe, uh, th- because they experience some kind of joy or satisfaction in the gift that they have have given so why am i sharing this with you <laughs> you know uh, maybe it's because i was a psych major and i'm these kind of things are interesting to me but no uh, there's a, there's more to it it's because we as christians can so easily approach giving in one of these three ways and 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 it's not necessarily a, a bad thing to to feel those feelings and they could sound harmless except if that was your primary motivation see as christians um we, we prepare to give to God. We need to reorient our hearts to the reason why we're giving in the first place. See, all those psychological reasons I talked about why people give, they sound, they sound harmless. They sound um, like it's not a big deal, but they're all motivated from an internal perspective, right? I believe in their mission. I believe my money changes things. I believe or I find enjoyment in this. But as Christians, our motivation for giving shouldn't start with ourselves. It should start at the cross. It's John 3.16 that informs how we live out 1 John 3.16. And this is what I mean by that. John 3.16, we all know this, right? Maybe most of us. For God so loved the world that he gave, right? But what did he give? He gave his son. He gave something that was dear to him. It's not theoretical here. His love um, had action. He gave. And because of this action, we as Christians can respond with 1 John 3.16, which says this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay it down our lives for our brothers. Then if we jump down to verse 18, it says, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So 1 John is reminding us that love is not just talk. Love is tangible. We as Christians should, should respond with the gratitude that God has given to us. Karl Barth has said this. He says, grace and gratitude belong together like heaven and earth. Grace evokes gratitude like the voice and echo. 
Gratitude follows grace as thunder follows lightning. So the act of giving is a vivid reminder to us as Christians that it's all about God. It's not about us. It's not about where, if we feel that you know, our money is, is going to a good cause. If we feel that, uh, that you know, giving, how it makes us feel in the moment. Giving affirms Christ's lordship. It, it dethrones us and it exalts God. So with that, let me pray for us and let's pray for the offering this morning. God, I thank you for your son Jesus who came um, and, and gave up of his life as an example so that we can echo that in, in word and deed as we've been reminded this morning. God, I, I pray that you bless this offering um, and multiply it for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, nice to have you here. We're actually going to have Diane Crosswood come up and uh, read our passage of scripture this morning. So let's uh, listen up for that. Good morning, Foothill Church. Today's scripture is found in Exodus chapter 1, verses 5 through 22. So let's please stand for the word of the Lord. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. This is God's word. You may be seated. Well, thanks, Diane. Um, hey, good morning, everybody. Glad to have you here at Fiddle Church this morning. My name is Stephen Coffinrath, I'm one of the pastors here. And um, yeah, we're excited to be in Exodus this morning. And um, hopefully you have your Bibles open, ready to go already. And this morning we are kind of starting this new journey together for, uh, for the foreseeable future. Looking forward to what the Lord has for us in these, uh, these verses. And I want to encourage you, first off, um, if you did not hear last week's sermon, um, as Pastor Chris kicked us off, uh, just make sure to catch up. There are some tools that we want to equip you with when it comes to understanding how we read this book, and uh, re really helpful from last week. Um, one of the things that we must understand about the God of the Bible, one of the things that he, he is he's telling us through the words of Scripture is that he wants to be known. And that's something that I, I want to kind of frame this morning out and, and for you to just be reminded, God wants to be known. And can we stop and just think about that for, for a second? God wants to be known. And I don't know what notion or thought you have of who God is and, and, and kind of maybe how he operates, but he is not trying to be mysterious or coy or, 
or kind of hold his cards close to the chest. That's not the God that we see in scripture. God is very open and forthright about who he is and his character. And he'll go to great lengths in scripture for us to see who he is and see his hand at work. And in large part, as we consider this this passage in Exodus this morning, uh, this is what we see about God, that he does very little to to hide himself. He, He wants us to know who he is. And so as we walk through this passage this morning, I want to persuade you that the God of the Bible is a God worth knowing and fearing. The God of the Bible is a God worth knowing and fearing. And there are three things that uh, I want you to understand and know about who God is in Exodus chapter one, okay? Number one is this, God is providential. God is providential. Number two, God is sovereign. Even in the midst of evil, God is sovereign. And number three, God is awesome and worthy of our fear. So let's jump in together. The first thing we see um, is in these first seven verses that God is providential. God is providential. Let's, you just heard it, but I'm going to read this, this first part again. Uh, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong. The writer, Moses, by the way, is is the writer. The, The writer doesn't want you to miss this. He's recalling something from Genesis. And if you've read Genesis recently or just in your lifetime at some point, a lot of Genesis deals with the promises, the blessings of God. And so we're seeing some of these promises being kind of re-mentioned from Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, where God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and, and fill the earth. And what we're reading here in Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, is this is actually happening now. These, these blessings, these promises are coming to fruition and, and I want to just remind you, church, that one of the unmistakable ways that God is providing for his people is through their fruitfulness. That's why we see all these names here, by the way. Whenever you see names in, in scripture that are just listed this way, I would encourage you not to just pass over them. These are important names, and they're listed out for a reason. And it's to, sh- to show that God is, is, is coming through on his promises, to be literal, Genesis it says that we are made in God's image. And so as all these people are, are being reminded, or being reminded of all these names, as his people increase, his image, his glory, his renown also increase. I, I want you just to look around for a minute. Uh, turn around and see your neighbor. Look at your neighbor for a second. Maybe just their eyes and eyes. And if you're at home, see who's sitting where, around you uh, in your living room. Every single one of us are sitting here today and we are a testament to God's glory, not because of what we do, not because of what we've done this morning or how we've contributed to, uh, to society in any way, but simply because we're made in God's image. Because of that fact, we, we show God's glory. This is why throughout history, and we see this over and over again in the ancient world, kings would set up statues of themselves that essentially said, this is my territory. This belongs to me. Rulers have, have minted coins, right? We still have uh, money and currency today on, on dollar bills where it's their faces, their profiles to mark their, their era. Presidents and kings still to this day have their portraits painted, commissioned and painted with hopes that their, their art would, would hang in hallways for years and years. But this idea first came from God. It first came from Yahweh, from the God of the Bible, that through the blessing of his people, people made in his image, people running all over the, around the world, showing off his glory. So the reason the Israelites grew from 70 to millions in 400 years is because God blessed them. Because God wants to be known in all the earth. And the best way for him to do that in this this time was to allow the Israelites to be fruitful and multiply for the sake of his own glory. And so that means having a lot of children. Let me just say something for a minute about having kids. Um, Children 
are a gift from the Lord. Children are a gift from the Lord. Now, now, as I get into this, let me couch this with something that's important for you to hear me say as well. Listen, listen, church, being a parent and having kids is not the ultimate goal in life. Okay, that's not what I'm saying at all. There are many other ways that God can bless you and use your life. Some of you can't have kids, and that doesn't make you any less. But what I am saying is that if you do have children, they are a blessing. I know it doesn't feel that way sometimes, but they are a blessing. Children are a reminder of God's blessings. There's a book called What to Expect When No One's Expecting. And it's about the falling birth rate in America. Um, Listen to this just for a minute. In 1979, the world's fertility rate was 6.0. Okay, 6.0. You need actually a rate of 3.1 to replace yourself. So that means in the 80s, the world's population was growing. All right, we with me so far? So today, different story. According to this book, globally, it's somewhere now around 2.4, and it's rapidly falling. In America, the the fertility rate is now 1.77, which is well below our replacement rate. So here's how the author says it at the end. Think about this. He says this, although there are many good reasons to have your first baby, at the end of the day, there is only one good reason to go through the trouble a second time or a third time or a fourth time because you believe in some sense that God wants you to. So the basic reason for some people, for a lot of people, if we're honest, that we stop having children is because we, 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 we see them as a burden and not a blessing. We see them as a burden, not a blessing. We live in a culture, honestly, that values a, a litter of dogs more than uh, a, you know, a van full of kids. Children cost money. Children are time-consuming. Children ensure that you can't do what you plan to do, right? I mean, I'm speaking from experience here. I, I, I realize children aren't convenient all the time. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've seen, um, you know, people kind of just look at our family, but not with our four kids, and they kind of just look at me, and they're like counting our kids up, and they're like, seriously? Like, you did that on purpose? Do you, do you know how that works, right? It's kind of like you get those comments. And it's like, yeah, like I, we did it on purpose. And, and it's kind of become out of vogue to see kids as a blessing, but it is. Fiddle Church, we have approximately 402 kids, 402 kids in our kids' ministry program. We are a blessed church. Foothill, if, if you are a parent, if, if you have one kid or five kids, it doesn't matter, you, you are blessed, And I know it doesn't feel that way sometimes, but you're blessed. And one of the ways that God shows his covenant promises to Israel is to increase their number of children. So let me just kind of remove this idea of providence when it comes to having kids away from kids specifically for a minute. Children are the obvious blessing here. But let me just ask you also, when it comes to God's character and seeing him at work here in Exodus 1 verses 1 through 7, How has God been providential to you in this time? Maybe it's through your kids, but but perhaps it's other ways. Many of you have kept your jobs in the midst of a teetering economy. Do you see God's hand at work? Do you recognize that God is, is for you and he's helping you? Many of you have stayed healthy in the midst of a global pandemic. Maybe you've even been healthier than ever. Do you see how God is preserving you and helping you? And I just want to encourage you, let us keep watch. Let us look out for ways that God is providing so that we may praise his character and thank him for his goodness to us. And so that's the first thing I want us to see here is that God is providential. What else do we see about God's character in Exodus 1? Secondly, God is sovereign. God is sovereign even in the midst of evil meaning that God is all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he is in charge, he's in control, even when evil things happen. So let's look at verse 8 here. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Verse 8 signals that something ominous is happening. All right, so if you're, you're watching a movie and you kind of are introduced to a character early on in that movie and the, the music changes a little bit, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? This is what we're seeing in verse 8. There's, there's this evil 
kind of shady character who, who comes on the scene. Um, and, and by the way, we established last week, if you remember, that the book of Exodus is ultimately about who? Who's it about? It's about God, right? It's not about Moses. It's not about the Ten Commandments. Exodus is about God. Now, the fact that he's the main character is, is, is important and known to us because we, we've been reading about this. But it appears that no one let Pharaoh in on that bit of theology because Pharaoh thinks that this story is about him. And we start to see the way that he kind of comes on the scene with this inflated sense of self-importance that, like, I'm the man, right? I'm going to come in here and start all these new reforms and policies and do all these things. And Pharaoh... It, I would go so far as to say Pharaoh really sees himself as an equal to Yahweh. That he sees himself as an equal sparring partner to God. And that's kind of the narrative through this first half of Exodus. And we'll see that in the next couple of verses. Now in verse 8, going back to this passage, why is it important that the writer, Moses, notes that the new king did not know Joseph? Why is that relevant? Well, if you recall the story of Joseph in Genesis 47, you don't have to turn there, but maybe just write down Genesis 47, look back at that later on. You'll remember that Joseph is a national hero in Exodus, I mean, in Egypt, I mean. And Joseph, because of God's wisdom and timing and because of his planning, he directed the whole nation of Egypt to set aside food and provisions during a time of plenty when there was a famine coming. So Joseph is like known in Egypt. He's a guy who, who people remember and people are grateful to. And he saved countless lives. But as we read in verse 8, this new king, this new guy comes on the scene and either he wasn't briefed or he didn't care to know about the history, this wonderful kind of historical relationship between the Hebrews and the Egyptians. And so this new king comes and he sees the Hebrews and there is no goodwill. There is no high fives. There's no like nice lunch on the way in. Scholars think that he, he, he really saw these, uh, these Hebrews as kind of a, almost an immigration issue, uh, a, a problem when it comes to like, this king was kind of a nationalist and he saw the Hebrews as a stain on what could be kind of the perfect backdrop of Egyptian culture. So Pharaoh, as we see, he begins to put his plan in place. He begins to look at how can I start to systematically root out this issue? And I want to walk through this, uh, these next verses, kind of through his perspective. What, is, what does Pharaoh do? What does Pharaoh think that he's up to here um, from his perspective? I'm going to skip around a little bit, but I'll return back to some, some key things here. Look at verses 9 and 10. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. So here's what Pharaoh is doing, this new king. He's being political. He's being shrewd. He's kind of thinking strategically about how he can phrase this narrative and, and kind of really uh, shape the narrative that, hey, look, if Egypt was to have any kind of, you know, chink in the armor, have any issue when it comes to their success or their prosperity, it's tied to the Hebrew people. There's too many of them. And we can't do what we want to do because all these people are here taking jobs, taking resources. And so we kind of, we should probably think about ways to get rid of them. And this is what he does. And it's not true. In fact, much of the success that Egypt is experiencing is because of these people. But it's politicking. And Pharaoh knows that he can't go straight to just booting them out. And so he starts to spin this narrative. He starts to plant this bug in the Egyptians' ears, setting the tone early. And he labels them as a threat. So verse 12. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. And the more they spread abroad, and the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. This is, this is not unlike many of our history books that, that we've read in school. In the same way, this type of posturing and, and fear-mongering is as what we saw in Hitler's Germany. Right? There's this kind of like propaganda that's starting about uh, about the Jewish problem. And so Hitler got all the academics in a room and said, how do, we, how do we kind of posture this in a way that makes the Jews look like the issue? And so we saw this in the 40s in Germany. 
in Mao's China, there was a, a lot of talk about what to do about the Christian problem. And so there was propaganda and, and, and leaflets that were written. And this has kind of been the case on and on ago. And what we start to see here is that Pharaoh is on the road to kind of being this textbook example of genocide. And from that point of view, political posturing, propaganda, it always turns to physical oppression. Verses 13 and 14. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they, made, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. The idea of, of being ruthless here that Moses brings up twice in, this, in this kind of, these verses is really the idea of violence. That's what he's getting at. There was violence that was ongoing as a part of what it meant to be kind of a, a Hebrew, an Israelite. Uh, violence was a regular part of their, of their day. And we know this too because when we see when Moses gets involved later on, as you guys probably know the story, that violence is kind of how he's introduced into the story. So then from there it gets darker and even more secretive. Verses 15 and 16. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, you shall let her live. So again, Pharaoh is now kind of starting to reveal his, his car, reveal his hand, that he's, he's, he's kind of a psychotic person. He, he rolls out this latest policy, kill all the boys. And it starts to get a bit dark because Pharaoh says to kill all the boys. Well, I have to ask, you know, why, why just the boys and, and not the little girls? Well, in Pharaoh's dark mind, girls can be used. Girls can be trafficked. Girls can be sold. And perhaps most importantly for the time, a little girl was of no threat to the kingdom of, of Egypt. It's disgusting and, and dark. And he finally kind of rounds this corner to just, just to open murder. Verse 22, then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Now this is an edict. This is a, hey, everybody has to be involved in this. He said to all the people, here's the new law in the land. If you see a little boy playing in the street, you throw him in the river. If you see a, a newborn baby uh, in the arms of, of a mother, you grab him by the leg and you throw him in the river. This is intense. This is dark. And, and he starts to kind of really reveal who he is by the, the lengths at which he's willing to get his job done. Okay, let's, let's pause here for a minute. Because this plane is, crashed, is passing by. That's helpful too. Before we get too far in thinking that Pharaoh is this mastermind genius, before we get too far in thinking that Pharaoh really knows what he's doing and he's starting to put all these things in place and oh my gosh, he's got this systematic plan and he's this leader of Egypt and he's kind of winning the game here. Before we get too far, I want to remind you that God is in the midst of this. That God is, is sovereignly working behind the scenes. That is perhaps the most important thing from these verses, 8 through 22, that God is, is, at, is at work. He's in the midst of evil, working. And he wants us to know his character, church, even in the midst of evil. He wants us to know that we can count on his goodness and his graciousness, even in the midst of evil, while all this is happening. And, and by the way, this isn't overnight. This isn't happening, you know, in just a week's span. We read this plan that Pharaoh enacted, you know, just in a few minutes. But this is years of kind of methodical, systematic work that Pharaoh is trying to, to work out. And all throughout, God is at work behind the scenes. I want to remind you of something that Charles Spurgeon once said. He says, God is too good to be unkind. He is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. I love that. When we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. And going back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, when the serpent deceived 
Adam and Eve, and they, they bought in, they sinned, they, they fell to their sinful nature. When it seemed like the serpent had, had won the day, when, when, and when he had actually got the better of them, at the same time, God was already working. God was in the midst of evil, working out a plan of redemption for his people. Fast forward to the end of the Gospels, when when Satan and the demons believed they won, they did it. They killed Jesus Christ on the cross. And what do we know, Christians? That God was working in the midst of evil. That three days later, that same, that same Savior would, would rise from the grave. Listen, Foothill, that this work that God does is not just in the pages of Scripture. It's not just some theological abstract. It is work that he is actually still doing in the midst of evil today. God is at work in your life, in my life, and if you have been wronged, if you've experienced some type of evil done to you, God is at work because we realize that the God of Exodus is the same God that we serve today. God cares for you. Listen, God cares about you, and he cares what you're going through, And his care is meant to be kind of nuanced and laying over your experience as you experience life in a broken world, in a fallen world. God's care extends to you if you've been abused. For every child who's been hurt or taken advantage of. And even when evil happens to you, when evil happens to us, as Spurgeon reminds us, when we cannot trace his hand, we can trust his heart. We were never promised easy lives as Christians. And even when you are experiencing pain and evil is done to you, I want to remind you, church, that God loves you, that God is working on your behalf behind the scenes. Well, how does that work? Let's go back to the passage for a minute and and find out how does God do this in Exodus 1. One of the clear and most consistent ways that God does his work is God, God uses the weak and the powerless to accomplish his plan. We see that God doesn't go with the obvious choice. In Exodus 1, we see these Hebrew midwives. Shifra and Pua, they feared God. And apparently that was enough. They are used by God to save dozens, probably hundreds of baby boys that were supposed to be thrown into the river, that were supposed to be killed upon delivery, and and they, they disobey. Verse 18, So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, well, because the Hebrew Hebrew wives, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women for they are vigorous. They give birth before a midwife comes to them. And so God dealt well with the midwives. And what does he do? And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. I want to remind you again, the Hebrew midwife is not the obvious choice, right? Like God has, God has every resource at hand. Like he could have brought, even in Exodus 1, he could have, through, through time travel or something, brought in SEAL Team 6, right, and brought them into Egypt at that point and said, we're going to deal with this problem this way. He decides not to do that. He says, I'm going to use these Hebrew midwives. And I want to remind you, at this point in human history, society had a very low view of women. In fact, a woman's word was not admissible in the court of law. You could trade and sell women. And as God is working in the midst of evil, this is not the most obvious choice to accomplish this goal. But that's exactly the point, because God continues to use the weak to show his power through our weakness. If you've ever heard a Christian testimony before, the whole... The whole idea behind what is a testimony, it's this idea that God is showing his power through our weakness. If you've ever talked about, you know, how you used to live in sin and now how you don't because God's power was in that, that's what he's doing. He's he's showing how through our weakness, God is made strong. He did it with David, the shepherd boy who would become king and kill a giant. He, he will do this again in, Mo, in Exodus when we read about how Moses actually couldn't speak very well in front of people. He didn't have very good leadership skills or abilities. He does it with Rahab, the prostitute. He does it with Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was a, a nobody girl from a nobody town. None of these people 
are A-list, first choice folks. And God sees these strong, courageous Hebrew women and says, I can use someone like that to advance my sovereign plan and to rescue these babies, to rescue these people. And he blesses the midwives and he gives them families all because they feared the Lord. Which brings me and us to our last attribute this morning. God is awesome and worthy of our fear. God is awesome and worthy of our fear. The word awesome is kind of a tr tricky word a little bit because it is usually misapplied, right? Um, this burrito is awesome, right? This movie is awesome. I mean, it's good, right? It, it's helpful, it's delicious, it's well-made, but is it awesome? The word has kind of taken on a life of its own, right? Like any Hamilton fans here? right? Awesome. Wow. Right? Like there's, there's this kind of flippantness now that we use the word awesome and it's really misapplied. And so when I want to remind you that God is awesome, let's flesh this out again. First of all, we need to realize the idea of biblical fear is tied to awe, awe and wonder. That the fact that I'm standing in front of a, a God who is, is worthy of our fear now, when we're, we're fearful of God, it doesn't mean that we're necessarily scared of him. Sometimes it does, and that's probably right, but it usually more, more oftentimes means that we gain a sense of perspective, okay? So I have to take a step back. So let's, let's say, for example, you're standing next to a, a huge wall mural, and you don't realize it. And, and a friend of yours says, wow, like, that's, that's an amazing mural you're standing next to. And you turn around, and you, you, you realize, like, oh my God, Oh my goodness, like I'm standing next to this big piece of art. I have to step back and gain perspective. That's the idea of, of awe that I'm talking about. That I have to physically kind of get my, my senses straight, the, the right sense of scale as I consider the details and the colors and the, 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 the artistry. Last year, um, my family and I went on a road trip and for the first time ever, I saw the Grand Canyon. How many of you guys have been to Grand Canyon before? All right, those of you guys who do not have your hands raised, I would encourage you to go, right? It's, it's, it's in the desert and it's kind of far away-ish, but listen, just for the opportunity to experience what I'm talking about here, I've never been before, I know it's so cliche, but there is seriously something about stepping that close to the edge of something so large and vast that it takes your breath away because I realize that I'm actually in danger. Like if I, if I slip and fall here, I could die. And that brings me to a place of fear. And that's the closest thing I've ever experienced in real time as far as what does it mean to have this sense of awe uh, about God and also kind of fear at the same time. So to be struck by the fear of the Lord, it means we see a holy and awesome God in, in kind of the right perspective when it comes to my small and sinful self. And so let's get back to this response in chapter one. Pharaoh summons these women. They are being questioned. And let me remind you what we already know. Pharaoh is a psychopath, right? He's not a rational person. We know who this guy is. He belongs in the pantheon of sick, messed up, psychotic rulers in history. And he asked the midwives, why didn't you obey me? Wow. I mean, Think about the worry and angst you and I would feel in that situation, standing in front of, face to face with Pharaoh. They know what they've done, and so what do they do? They start spinning this crazy lie. Well, you know, us, us Hebrew pregnant ladies, we're tough, and we kind of get after it. And, uh, you know, even before we get there, these women are pushing, and they... They deliver babies before we even can get there. I mean, we, we want to do what you're saying. We want to kill the babies, okay? But the timing is just off. I mean, this is crazy. This is an underrated part of the passage. Uh, what in the world would cause these women to lie in the face of a psychopath? Where, where are they getting this from? Well, very simple. They had a fear for God that outweighed any fear they had for Pharaoh. 
this fear was rightly placed. And as we see in these midwives, the fear of God develops godly courage. King David expressed this well in the Psalms, Psalm 27, verses 1 through 3. He says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom am I going to be afraid of? Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. In this I will be confident. Is your fear, is your awe, is your respect rightly placed, Christian? Have you experienced a, a, a picture, an idea of who God is to the point where you're not worried about what the world thinks anymore? Or are you more concerned what your friends think, what your boss thinks, all the people that you haven't seen in five years on social media, and yet you, 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 you bend over backwards for them? When, when there's one person who really matters, God is awesome and worthy of our fear, and yet we are so willing at times to set, aside, set that aside for lesser fears. And so God is making himself clear to the Israelites and to you and to me today. He's reminding us that he will provide for your need, that he is sovereign and in control, even in the midst of dark days that we are experiencing even, even this year, and that he is awesome and worthy of our fear and our reverence. And even more amazingly, this same awesome God who has made himself clear uh, in Exodus 1, this God already knows you because he's created you. He loves you. And listen, thousands of years after this Exodus is all finished and wrapped up, he will send his son Jesus to die on your behalf so that you could be in right relationship with him. That is a God worth knowing a God worth giving our days to, a God worth giving our lives to. Do you see God this way, church? Let me just ask you to bow your heads with me as we wrap this up. And I want us just to do some reflection as we consider what, what God is teaching us about himself. And I want you right now, with your, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to think reflectively about the characteristics of the Lord. And I want you to take note, have you seen God provide in these days for you and your family? Have, have you seen him provide a job, provide help in some ways? And, and maybe you've even pushed it aside and said, well, that's because I worked hard. Well, that's because A, B, and C lined up. And we have stolen the glory from God and attributed it to some lesser thing. Have you seen his providential hand? Have you seen his sovereign hand at work? And has that caused you to stand in awe of who he is? Or is your fear and your worry still tied up in lesser things? I just want to take maybe 30 seconds right now, just in silence, and reflect on, on the last few months. I think about God's providence and sovereignty in our lives. God, we, we confess this morning that we sometimes, you usually, oftentimes, we don't see you rightly. We don't respect and fear your power. And so, God, I want to I wanna ask that you would remind us of that in this moment. God, help us to know who you are and even in deeper and greater ways this week so that when we can't trace your hand, we can trust your heart. God, you are so good. You are so loving to us. You are working behind the scenes. And sometimes we just neglect to say that out loud. 
And so God, I pray that that would, that would fuel our hearts this week to live lives of worship, realizing that it's, it's all because of you in your hand. And God, we, we ask for forgiveness for the times that we don't recognize that. You are at work. You want to be known. And God, help us to know you even greater. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, if, if, you, if you are sitting here today and, and you still want to know more about who God is, and if, if you're feeling at this moment like God is drawing me closer to himself for the first time, I want to encourage you. We'd love to know about that. Uh, please text that number that you saw earlier, 626-469-7070. Let us know that you want to become a follower of Jesus. We'd love to be able to encourage you in that, uh, support you. We'd love to get you a Bible if you don't have one. Uh, please let someone know this morning. We're going to transition to a time of the Lord's Supper. Let me just remind you what we're doing here. As we remember and, and think upon what the Lord has done for us, how his great plan of salvation has worked out through over time in history, what we're doing right now is we open up this top section, pull out this little cracker. We're remembering how, how God sent his son to die for us, to to have his body be broken for, for us. And so this is what he says, this is my body broken for you. Let's eat this bread in remembrance of him. Let's do that right now. Then Jesus took the cup. The night before he was, he was killed on the cross, and this cup, this juice is a symbol of the shed blood for us that he gave for us. And so we say thanks and let's, let's remember together. Amen. Well, let's, um, let's stand together. Let's, let's lift our voices. Let's lift our hands and worship as we reflect on who God is. is good and we can count on you father we'll go in the grace of, of god our lord jesus christ I pray you guys would have feel his peace today and you'd feel the joy of being among the fellow believers and as we go out today also you have a chance just to serve and hang out with us further as we tear down these wonderful tents and put away some equipment well, god bless you guys see you later <laughs>